Welcome to the Dakota Live Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Morier. The goal of this podcast is to help you better know the people behind investment decisions. We introduce you to chief investment officers, research professionals, sales leaders, and other important players in the industry who will help you sell in between the lines and better understand the investment sales ecosystem. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Live content, please check out dakota.com to learn more about their services. Uh, Before we get started, I need to read a brief disclosure. Uh, This content is provided for informational purposes and should not be relied upon as recommendations or advice about investing in securities. All investments involve risk and may lose money. Dakota does not guarantee the accuracy of any of the information provided by the speaker who is not affiliated with Dakota. Not a solicitation, testimonial, or an endorsement by Dakota or its affiliates. Nothing herein is intended to indicate approval, support, or a recommendation of the investment advisor or its supervised persons by Dakota. Today's episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace, the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time, and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakotamarketplace.com today. Well, I am thrilled to introduce our audience to Andy Reid, uh, Head of Investor Behavior Research, and Kevin Kang, Head of Active and Alternatives Research with Vanguard. Welcome to the show and welcome to the studio. Thanks for having thanks us. For having yeah, us. thanks for being here. And as always, my partner on the desk, Dandy Domenico. Robert, gonna have to get you? used to this today. A little right turn. It's That's exciting right. to have two people on the desk. We're usually a trio, so um, you know, for us, it's it's really exciting to have the both of you. Uh, it's uh, particularly thinking about what's been going on in the markets over the last few years, um, how Vanguard has grown uh, incredibly successfully, and then your respective roles. Uh, I know our audience is going to be very interested to hear more about that. But before we do get into that side of the conversation, if it's okay, I'm going to read your biographies, and then we will uh, we'll get to the questions. Well, Andy Reid is head of investor behavior research in the Investment Strategy Group. He leads a global team of behavioral scientists who study how and why investors make decisions, cultivating insights and strategies to promote better choices for millions of investors. His research blends psychology and economics to explore the role of personality and emotion in decision making how behavioral biases and risk tolerance shape investor preferences, and the impact of choice architecture on decisions. Uh, Before joining Vanguard, Andy was a vice president in behavioral economics at Fidelity, where he established a behavioral economics practice. At Fidelity, he co-authored white papers on financial wellness and total well-being, conducted large-scale experiments to improve investor outcomes, and presented research insights to investors, financial advisors, and retirement plan sponsors. Previously, he was an associate research scientist at Columbia University and a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University. Andy earned a BA in History and Psychology from Swarthmore College and an MA and PhD in Developmental Psychology from Cornell University. Kevin Kang is head of Active and Alternatives Research in Vanguard's Investment Strategy Group. He leads Vanguard's research efforts on active management, alternative investments, and personalized indexing. Among his areas of expertise are portfolio construction, risk management, tax-aware investing, and household finance. Kevin joined Vanguard in 2017 as a senior risk manager, manager with the firm's quantity equity group. Earlier in his career, he served as a director of BlackRock and a senior quantitative researcher at State Street Global Advisors. Kevin's research is widely published in practitioner and academic journals, including the Financial Analyst Journal, the Journal of Investment Management, the Journal of Portfolio Management, the Journal of Retirement, and the IMF Economic Review. He has presented his research to global regulators, portfolio managers, academics, and financial advisors, and his work is frequently featured in the news media. Kevin holds a PhD in finance from Northwestern University, an MA in economics from the University of British Columbia, and a BAH in economics from Queen's University in Kingston. Thank you both for being here and congratulations on all of your success. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Well, like I said before, there are four on the desk, so it's a special day for us at Dakota Live. Uh, We're honored to have you both here uh, in in sharing your expertise in the context of your roles and responsibilities with Vanguard. Uh, If you're not familiar with Vanguard, I'll just quickly say uh, the Vanguard Group is an American registered investment advisor based in Malvern, Pennsylvania, uh, with approximately $7.7 trillion in global assets under management as of April 2023. It's the largest provider of mutual funds and the second largest provider of exchange traded funds in the 
the world. So I usually like to start with our guests' beginnings. Uh, and for both of you, obviously, academia played a very large and prominent role in your early careers. But could you share a little bit about uh, you, you know, your backgrounds as it relates to your academic paths and, and how it took you to your, your current roles, maybe starting with you, Andy? Sure. Yeah. So I think um, I, I sort of had good fortune as an undergrad. So I started studying psychology. And I ended up in a class with Barry Schwartz, who wrote The Paradox of Choice. And this was right around the time that he was actually publishing the book. And Barry is an amazing researcher, but he's also incredibly humble. So we didn't know the book was coming out. But he was teaching about judgment and decision making. I was learning about all these different biases and heuristics and all the quirks of human nature and, and where people kind of get it wrong. And I thought, this is really fascinating. Uh, and I ended up doing some research with him and, and thought, you know, I'd love to continue doing research uh, on judgment and decision making. And specifically learn not just about sort of how people make choices, but specifically around where they go wrong and what can we do to nudge them towards better choices. Uh, so I ended up doing uh, dissertation research on work that is very much inspired by Barry's research. So it was really around not so much what are the consequences of having too much choice, but how much choice do people actually want? And so this was kind of, you know, early, mid 2000s. And, and there was this proliferation of choice across all sorts of domains. So you have... You know, this was around the time when Medicare Part D was rolling out. There were, you know, dozens of options for uh, health insurance plans. And the question was, do people want this amount of choice? And that's what we asked people. How much choice do you really want? And we found that people want a lot less choice than what is typically offered. And as you get older, you want even fewer options. And so there's, there's a little bit of wisdom that comes with age. Um, and so this kind of launched me into this field of judgment, decision making, behavioral economics and uh, I've just been like passionate about it ever since. I can certainly attest to that. I remember I took my father to Bye Bye Baby when my ba when my child was first born, and the amount of choices that we have as parents is overwhelming. So as investors, it's equally <laughs> overwhelming. So if you think about how things have changed for us, particularly relative to our parents, it's very interesting. Kevin, I'd love to hear yours as well. I thought going into undergrad um, college, I thought I was going to be a political science major. I always thought social science very interesting. Um, and then... Um, I was given the advice that, well, why don't you think about it? economics? You like math, uh, which I did, but then I just didn't really have as much of a you know, passion for just natural sciences. So, you know, somebody told me that, well, it's a good, good area where you can combine, you know, your love of math and then sort of, you know, what you like about social sciences. So started doing that and then just quickly realized that. So when I started undergrad, that was in early 2000s. Everybody's talking about the stock market and how terrible it is um, or how, you know, you know, people didn't really see that coming, um, the dot-com bubble bursting. So... That was interesting to um, interesting time to be studying economics to begin with, and then um, quickly realized that I just really loved almost everything, um, every subdiscipline in economics, from industrial organization to uh, macro, in particular macro to finance. So from that point on, I was just kind of um, basically trying to figure out how do I continue to do this and then get paid for it. Um, so, so <laughs> the million dollar question. Yeah, so there's there's this macroeconomist uh, by the name of uh, Greg Menke who actually wrote a pretty famous first year principles of economics textbook. So I think he is kind of well known for many other things, but for me, he you know he he says that the trick of life is to do what you love to do and then be um, be acknowledged for it and then be appre appreciated for it. So from that point on, I think that was just kind of like the way I thought about this, and then um, you know it just led me to. Um, a one year terminal master's degree out in beautiful Vancouver and then and then ultimately to um, the States to uh, go to grad school in Chicago. I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that. Well, thinking a little bit, Andy, about your career path, um, most of our audience are asset allocators and investment sales professionals, but we also open these podcasts up to a wider audience. So uh, I think it would be helpful for everyone maybe as a quick refresher as to what we're looking to achieve when understanding the, the fundamentals of investor behavior. So what are the core principles that you think about? Maybe going back to your own research and then thinking about it practically today. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think at the core, behavioral economics is about the gap between what investors should do and what they actually do. <laughs> and so we have experts you know, like Kevin who have background in economics and finance who say the optimal decision is X, right? Whatever it is. Uh, and then there's psychologists who say, well, actually, people don't do that because people have limitations. They have cognitive limitations. Emotions get in the way. Uh, we don't always have the time or energy to do the right thing. And so behavioral economics is about, I would say, two things. So identifying the gap between what people ideally should do for the best possible outcomes and what they tend to or actually do. And then the second thing is, how do we close that gap? Um, and so I think historically, 
the field you know, of behavioral economics, behavioral science, judgment, decision making, whatever you want to call it, for the first few decades was very much focused on look at all the ways in which people are not rational. Right, so Nobel Prize winning work by Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, showing, you know, here are all the heuristics and biases, the deviations from the optimal course of action. Um, but I think in the last couple of decades in particular, you've seen the rise in, I would call it like the nudge movement, right? So this focus on given what we know about human behavior, how do we kind of change the, the environment? How do we message people? How do we incentivize them to get to close that gap and to get them to make sort of better choices? Uh, and so I think that's what, what really motivates me and my team and our research is, you know, we, we want to identify the gap, but we want to also test ways to, to close the gap and improve outcomes for investors. Kevin, could you expand a little bit on your role and responsibilities with Vanguard? What was it about the firm uh, that felt it would be a good fit for your area of studies? And, and what were you looking to accomplish when, when you joined? You had, uh, you had the luxury of seeing a few other shops, yeah. uh, which I mentioned in your biography. Yeah, yeah. So you had some perspective. Uh, we'd love to hear kind of what, the, what that path looked like for you. Like many other things in life, moving uh, for my wife, moving back to the greater Philly area for, for a Vanguard position and then um, uh, for me joining Vanguard, it was more of a sort of a holistic, multidimensional decision. Um, it, was, it was a good move for the family, but it was also a good move for, for, uh, for me work-wise. And, and I guess what I was, um, as you mentioned, um, having been, um, you know, or having been with a few other shops or a few other companies, um, what I was looking for, I was looking for three things, um, roughly. So number one was kind of going back to what I said earlier about how do I continue to do um, research, with, which, which you know, I'm very passionate about, and, and make sure that I have that creative outlet, um, and then make sure that that is something that's um, useful for the organization that I'm part of. Um, in my prior roles, I had some of those, but then it was always kind of in you know, only part of the job requirement and maybe not the full requirement. So I was looking for more of that. And then the second piece was, um, and in, I think this is where I kind of align with the um, generations that are maybe slightly younger than me, where I was looking for a lot of meaning in work, you know, coming to Vanguard and meeting with people. I can't say I had, my first impression was as strong as it is now, having been there for six years, but still it was very palpable. It was very different. Uh, people were there were certainly more than just the monetary um, kind of drivers that was, you know, that, that, that was really driving people, um, you know, at Vanguard, many people at Vanguard anyway. So that was another thing. And then um, I really appreciate the integrity of the senior kind of management that I could see at the point. So kind of like those three things um, not to be taken for granted. Um, and, and I kind of saw the makings of those three actually working out and then it's, it's one of those things where, you know, every, with every passing year, things have gotten better. And then as you get to appreciate that, I think you just see that um, in this special organization. So that's kind of like what led me to join Vanguard, just to uh, give a brief answer to your questions about like community roles and responsibilities in my current role. So Andy and I are both part of um, this investment strategy group, which is basically an internal think tank. Um, so we do thought leadership, um, which can come out in, you know, various forms. So it could be a white paper. Um, if we want to basically kind of make how we're thinking about a certain topic known, but it also could be just an internal kind of consulting project. If we need to inform uh, a particular product offering within Vanguard um, or, you know, our particular stance on a given topic. Um, so it's, you know, my role is all about basically active. So just to be a little more concrete, it's basically three questions. Uh, very simple. One is, um, you know, why should people do active investing? Um, so that's a big question of why. And then the second question is who should do it? Kind of going, you know, maybe overlapping with Andy's field a little bit. It's not for everybody. And then third piece is kind of like how should you do it uh, so that you're actually, you know, effective and then you hopefully get the desired outcomes with active. That's interesting. Well, we look forward to diving more into that. Um, I think it's also very interesting talking about, you know, the why Vanguard, particularly the mission. I, I think we were kind of talking before uh, we started recording. I, 
done about 35 to 40 of these episodes. Dan has been on some of them before. So I've been kind of playing around with the transcripts and looking at the, the language that people have been sharing. And I've been amazed how often mission has come up. So, and it's not just endowments and foundations. It's corporate pension plans, public pension plans, how important it's become for people as to the mission of the organization. So it, it'll, it'll fit right into that trend data. So thank you for sharing that. We appreciate it. Well, I, I also read off a number of research areas for you. If I do it again, it might take up a lot of the show. How do you prioritize it all? I mean, any of those could be its own discipline. So as you think about that, that those three questions, how do you prioritize those research responsibilities? So I think I think what might be listed uh, on a publicly available web page, either my research page or uh, Vanguard profile, um, it, it's so maybe it requires a bit of an explanation what, why they're all listed to begin with. <laughs> so so it's, it's more of a so the, they're there it's as a reflection of the topics I've worked on so far. So um, coming out of grad school, my focus was actually on the drivers of housing market bubble, and then you know why people made speculative, well, what, what looked like ex post speculative investment decisions with their um, residential you know, homes. Um, so it actually had a, a bit of a behavioral angle to it because otherwise you can't really explain that. But ever since then, I was always uh, fascinated with um, what people do because they're very unpredictable to a degree. And then there's an, always an element of irrationality. And so, you know, the field of household finance has always stayed with me. Active portfolio management as well as portfolio construction, um, you know, I've kind of like lived that more on the front line um, earlier, you know, in the earlier part of my career. So I do have a research mindset, which is I'm always, you know, I have more questions than answers. And then just kind of being part of the process and portfolio construction process I came away from that experience thinking, oh, only if I had a full-time job where I could answer all these questions. Mm -hmm. So, so that kind of you know stayed with me, and then I'm, I still have a very long list of questions that I don't have the time to get to mm -hmm. from that. And then, and then the other piece is when I first moved over to um, within Vanguard to the, the, um, our current group, investment strategy group. Um, the first assignment that was given to me is, hey, Kevin, can you actually think about direct indexing and you know tax-aware investing? Mm -hmm. So that sort of agenda stayed with me for over three years now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's more of a reflection of you know what I've what I've been doing, and then uh, but right now the the main focus is really on active um, and you know answering those three questions. So if you think about active, what are some of the top priorities then that you're currently working on with Vanguard, particularly as it relates to you know active management, kind of maybe in the context of portfolio construction, you know the advice that the team is giving you know to the to the advisors. So maybe maybe I'll give I'll give two kind of two high level themes. Um, so the first one is just actually letting people know that Vanguard does a lot of active. Um, and I, I know that sounds like funny, but we're actually, in terms of assets under management, we're number two. If you go out there and then look at equity and uh, bonds, we're, we're a big part of that market. And, and it's always been the case. But because our um, passive and indexing franchise is so strong and it's been so successful that people just don't recognize that. And um, you know, um, in the same building that I work at on the third floor, um, there is an army of fixed income portfolio managers. Uh, who are incredibly fascinating to speak with. Um, and they're all active managers. Mm -hmm. So um, part of my job is to actually make sure that um, people know that, that we have that talent and then people know what they think to the extent that they can share uh, their thoughts, which are, again, uh, incredibly interesting. So one example that's coming out of that is, um, you know, I've recently partnered with the, our Muni um, desk. And then we're basically kind of opining on how the recent rate hikes over the last um, 18 months or, you know, however long it's been, um, followed following the very long, uh, lower for longer um, interest rate environment is putting incredibly interesting sort of wrinkle into the convexity management um, in the Muni world. So that's that's a very interesting one because it gives you the opportunity to think about, um, you know, different levers and different margins of active management. And, and, and so that's, that's coming out, so, but that's just an example. The other one is we have the, this is proliferation of all these active products that are out there um, and it's kind of trendy, um, as you know. But then the question is, do we, and this is where I think it's really interesting to be working on these questions from Vanguard, uh, from a place like Vanguard. Because we're, at the end of the day, we're kind of thinking about everything from the individual investor's point of view, which I, which I will also say it's, there's an incredible sort of diversity about, you know, around that. 
But nevertheless, it's an individual investor. It's not an endowment. So then from their point of view, we don't necessarily know if all that needs to be kind of, you know, known is known about, um, has been discovered and studied about how to actually construct a sensible active portfolio. So you have all these like wonderful product offerings. And then, but then what do you do with them? And then, you know, is one, one way to assemble them more sensible and align to the particular investment objective than a different one. So a lot of the current research portfolio is focused on that. Well, Andy, you've been with Vanguard for about a year now. Congratulations on the, the anniversary. And we we're talking about questions. There's no shortage of questions. I think one of the hardest things about research is when to stop asking questions and start going after some, some answers. So what are some of the questions that you're looking for answers now as you think about your own priorities uh, within the team and, and what you're particularly working on, maybe kind of parlaying off of what, uh, what Kevin had said? Yeah, uh, you know, I think building on on Kevin's point, I think we we kind of have this like model of how do we evaluate and prioritize research questions, and I think there's uh, someone on my team coined this term like the impossibility triangle of the criteria that we're trying to satisfy, and there might be trade offs. So the the biggest criteria is what has the biggest potential value to our clients, right? To the end investor, you know, as Kevin said, the individual investor. How can we give them the best chance of success? So really feeding into Vanguard's mission. So that's number one, first and foremost. The second is how do we generate insights that have external value you know, to folks like you, to folks, you know, listeners of the podcast, media, policymakers, you name it, really thought-provoking insights that influence the debate, influence how external groups think about the challenges facing investors. Uh, the third, I would say, in, in no particular order, uh, business value, right? So, you know, what are the needs of the business? As Kevin said, sometimes the business comes to us with a question and we try to, you know, provide the best possible answer. Um, and I would say the fourth thing is what, what are the research team passionate about? Uh, researchers, you know, if they're intrinsically motivated to engage with the question, the quality of the work is going to be better, the impact is going to be higher, and it's just going to be better for everybody's experience. And so, you know, trying to satisfy those four criteria is tricky. Uh, I would say at the highest level, we we try to look for um, research questions that can inform the design of, let's call it, billion-dollar solutions, mm -hmm. right? So if you think about the history of behavioral economics and going back, you know, 20 plus years ago, uh, probably around the time that, that Dan was at Vanguard, mm -hmm. uh, there was a trillion-dollar idea that was developed by behavioral economists Richard Thaler and Shlomo Bernardzi, which is the Save More Tomorrow uh, program in the 401k space. So automatic enrollment of, in 401k plans. Um, automatic increase program, so every year ratcheting up that savings rate, and uh, default uh, target date fund investments. The combination of these three tools led to you know, potentially a trillion dollars in extra retirement savings across all of the US. I mean, it's really become the norm for, for 401k plans. It's incredibly powerful. And so ideally, we're looking for the next trillion dollar idea. It's, I, I'm not sure if we'll get there, but a billion dollars would be nice. And I think, you know, Kevin actually collaborated with our team uh, last year on some research to identify an opportunity to deliver, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, tax advantage um, uh, outcomes for Vanguard investors. And now we're working with the business on sort of rolling out the deployment of a solution that's informed directly by the research. So, you know, as Kevin said, we, we sort of, we generate the insights uh, that's kind of first and foremost through rigorous, you know, scientifically grounded research. But then equally important is the application and dissemination of the insights. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of research questions, we're, we're interested in just about everything. Uh, just to rattle off a few topics, we're looking at, you know, what's the, what's the best way to think about, to measure, and to help investors understand risk? This is not something that comes naturally to human beings. We are not natural born, you know, statisticians, let's say. Uh, and so risk is, it's fundamental to making sound investment choices, but it's, it's not something people have an intuitive grasp of. Mm -hmm. um, we're also looking at the role of emotions in decision making. Um, this is something that, you know, all over the place, you see people talking about, you know, and I would say vilifying emotions and saying emotions are the enemy of investors. And what you'll notice if you look very closely at all the thought leadership in this space, there's not a whole lot of data. It's a lot of anecdotes and conjecture, and it's kind of you know old wives' tales maybe. Um, and so what we're trying to do is really get a, a rigorous understanding of, of how emotion can be beneficial or harmful, depending on the context for investors. Um, I would say those are those are two of the areas where we're focused on now. But you know, as Kevin said, it's we're, we're kind of passionate about a wide range of topics. 
and uh, our team keeps growing. So hopefully we can take on a, a broader and broader research portfolio over time. Well, you mentioned the challenges facing investors. I don't think we have enough time to list all of the challenges <laughs> yeah. that have faced investors over the last three or four years. Uh, it really has. And we talked a little bit of this, about this before the podcast, but how, how has that individual investor, as you see it from Vanguard's perspective, handled these events as it relates to their portfolio? So you're sitting back from a research perspective, looking at these investors, what they've faced from COVID throughout, um, how, how, would you, how would you say, um, generally speaking, uh, the, the reaction from investors has been from Vanguard's perspective? And the lasting impact that it's going to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think we, we think about it through a few different lenses. So, you know, first and foremost, what are they doing? So behaviorally, uh, second is more around the thinking and feeling. So how, you know, what's going on inside their minds? And so we can look at administrative data to understand behavioral trends. And what we see there is a lot of inaction, believe it or not. So uh, the basic finding is that on almost every day, almost every Vanguard investor is staying the course. And that's what we like to see, right? We don't want to see them you know, overreacting to the latest news or you know, market volatility, things like that. Um, even on the, the most active trading days, we're only seeing one to 2% of households making a trade. Uh, about three quarters of retail households didn't make any trades in 2022. So that's sort of the, the upside is that we're not seeing overreactions. You know, as the market goes down, we don't see people panic sell despite what you read in the, in the headlines. Uh, it might be happening elsewhere, but it's not happening at Vanguard. Um, and we're, what we're seeing is evidence of discipline and long-term perspective. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the principles that's absolutely core. We believe that when investors maintain discipline and long-term perspective, they have better outcomes and the research bears that out. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is if you look at sort of the sentimental side or the sentiment side of the equation, we have a, uh, a long-running survey. We've been running the survey every other month. We survey 2,000 investors um, from across both sort of the retail space, so think brokerages and IRAs, mm -hmm. as well as the institutional workplace side, which is, you know, 401k space. And we ask them, what do you think is going to happen in the market? What do you think is going to happen to the economy, the GDP over the next, you know, year, three years, 10 years? Mm -hmm. And what we found over the course of 2022 and into 2023 is that investors' expectations do change. Mm -hmm. So they're not you know, completely oblivious, oblivious to changes in the market. Mm -hmm. So they became more and more pessimistic in 2022 as the market went down. But as the markets rebounded in 2023, they become more and more optimistic. And right mm -hmm. now they're expecting you know, five and a half roughly percent returns over the next year mm -hmm. in, the, in the market. Um, now, there's a bit of a disconnect though, because I, you know, the, the, the behavior is showing a lot of inertia. The emotions, the expectations are changing. Um, so that doesn't mean that that investors are asleep at the wheel, but I would say that they are sort of, you know, maintaining that discipline. They're not overreacting, which is what we like to see. I think the opportunity that lies within is, you know, those three quarters of investors that made no changes. Was there an opportunity to rebalance? Was there an opportunity to reassess their portfolio and make a positive move? And that's something where we feel like there's an opportunity to intervene mm -hmm. and help because we don't necessarily want zombie investors, right? Yeah. Uh, stay the course doesn't mean do nothing. It means, you know, keep an eye on your portfolio, maybe rebalance when it's appropriate. Um, so we're, we've got some work to do. It must be interesting considering how much we've seen. So it's kind of that old saying, you know, I've seen it all before. So whatever comes next isn't going to rattle me as much. So thinking about emotions. The last few years, we've had a global pandemic. So unless you're 100 plus years old, you never lived through something like that before. Uh, we've seen war in Europe. So unless you're, what? 70 plus years old, you haven't really seen that before of the same magnitude. Um, we've seen uh, incredible market volatility. We've seen, you know, meme stock trading phenomena. So it's, it's just been, you know, major event after major event, these once in a lifetime black swan events. There've been a bunch of them in the last few years. And one of the sort of upsides, let's call it, of human psychology is that as we're exposed to, you know, intense, in some cases, stressful events, our reactions dampen over time. So we habituate to these types of events. And there's sort of this notion that stress breeds resilience. Uh, and I think that's probably what we're seeing right now is that the, the investor is resilient, the investor is optimistic, at least Vanguard investors. Uh, and we hope that the lessons learned of the past, you know, two, three years uh, persist over time. And so whatever comes down the road doesn't really phase them. They can maintain that discipline. That's a great point. And look, I mean, as you think about the the participants within Vanguard, the assets that you see, the patterns that you're able to identify trends. Kevin, I'd love to hear how you all set that, that priority, that agenda 
how you're trying to marry now the the top down and idea generation, how that's applied across traditional private markets. How does that help? And within your colleagues and your team, how does that set the agenda and priorities for you at Vanguard? So um, as Vanguard has grown and these things have just become more systematized. So um, we have, I, maybe I can just share a couple of committees that basically own that type of um, solutioning and thinking and you know decision-making. So one is uh, what's called the Strategic Asset Allocation Committee that's chaired by um, both Andy and you know, my ultimate uh, manager, um, Joe Davis. So he's the head of uh, Investment Strategy Group. And, you know, it's a multi-person group. Um, you know, Vanguard doesn't really have a culture where one person call, comes in and then calls a shot. So it, it everything that basically comes through that committee um, will have gone through a fairly rigorous um, first um, thinking for sure. And then uh, for the most part, research process. And then it'll be um, there's going to be a lot of due diligence, uh, kicking the tires. So so a lot. I guess maybe a, a simple way for me to say that is. We don't do a ton of, if at all, tactical asset allocation. Um, that's happening within the individual portfolio that's actively managed, um, you know, at that level, at the fund level. That's the, you know, PM's uh, prerogative and then the part of their responsibilities. But at the asset allocation level, um, it's primarily strategic asset allocation. So these things are, um, you know, very rigorously debated there. And then it basically then sets the tone. The interesting thing about Vanguard being Vanguard is that, and I mentioned this earlier, there is a huge diversity and heterogeneity of um, the types of investors that we need to think about. We need to think about the mom and pop investors who are maybe um, you know, business owners, uh, who have a very different sort of a lifetime income profile compared to someone who lives in W-2, uh, very predictable, white color sort of a job. Um, and then you know that's also different from ultra high net worth investors who we also serve. So. It's um, it's sort of that diversity that we need to be very cognizant of. And then uh, when we set the tone and then basically provide some sort of an you know, asset allocation solutions, we need to be very, very um, just aware um, who, who this is going to help. And that's where the other committee comes in, which is um, it's called the Advice Policy Committee. So it's chaired by one of my co-authors, um, Joel Dixon. Um, who's the basically head of that group. And then again, it, it, it is a multi-person group um, that basically committee that comes together and then, um, you know, basically comes up with the solutions. Back in 2014, Vanguard released a white paper on liquid alternatives called you know, Buyer Beware. Yeah. So at the time, I think you, they, they were asking a lot of the same questions um, almost a decade ago now. And it was funny, I, I noted you quoted Carl Sagan saying, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah. So I was thinking, I, I think claims have been tempered. Regulators have done a very good job of tempering claims over the last 10 years. But I'm curious from both of you about the evidence. You know, has the evidence changed? You know, to it's. I know it, you you do introduce it, but as you think about it on an individual basis, if you think about the behavior you know, of an investor as they're thinking about an alternative product, arguably it, it may have the same liquidity profile, but we're not really sure maybe what makes up the uh, the constituents of the uh, of the zoo, as you said. Investors are often a lot less knowledgeable about you know complex or unusual investment vehicles than than the designers of those vehicles might assume, and so this is a little bit of like. As an industry, financial services, you know, it's it's almost like we design these products and these experiences by experts for experts, and so there's a little bit of an empathy gap in in terms mm -hmm. of the fact that, you know, two thirds of Americans don't understand they can't convert one in a thousand to 0.1 percent, right? They're not financially literate, right? So the the basic level of knowledge about you know basic money matters, investing, you know, let alone these complex topics, is actually relatively limited, um, and so you know I think as Kevin said. As a firm, we're, we're both trying to understand what's the optimal way to integrate some of these things into a, a portfolio that drives better long-term outcomes. I think that's sort of half the challenge. The other half is sort of educating, informing, guiding people down the right path so that they they make the right choices and they feel good about the choices that they've made. Uh, and that's, that's I, I would say, maybe even more challenging because of the heterogeneity that Kevin said, right? Not every person, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the same terms may not resonate or may not be well understood by everyone. Uh, some of our investors, some of the, the active, you know, super engaged investors, maybe, you know, on the older side, they're savvy. They like being talked to as though they're experts because they consider themselves to be experts. Uh, whether that's true or not, we can put aside. <laughs> um, but, you know, typical investors, they, they're kind of uh, not necessarily searching for every little bit of alpha. 
um, they may just be wanting to keep up with the market. And so coming to Vanguard for, you know, what, what our traditional sort of bread and butter is in terms of low cost diversified index funds. Um, I will say one thing though, which I think is, is quite fascinating. The stereotype of Vanguard investors is that there are all these, you know, passive, let's say zombie investors, right? They come here for the index fund, they buy and they hold forever. And there's quite a few of those. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, but a few years ago, we actually analyzed the portfolios of investors at Vanguard. Now, we, we specifically looked at affluent investors, so keep that caveat in mind. What we found is that they were nearly as likely to hold active funds as they were to hold index funds. Mm -hmm. So it was something like you know, 80 to 85% of them held active and about 90% held index funds. So it's not just entirely all index all day. Um, so there is a little bit of that, you know, well, just as much appetite almost uh, for active products. Um, so, but I'll, I'll defer to, to Kevin on sort of the solution side. And I, I guess just about the claims um, softening or, or re, you know, being revised, I guess there's so, I want to maybe revisit why, and this is a bit of a revisionist history and reading into it, but why that, um, you know, liquid alts, you know, even became a thing to begin with. And, and that's, you know, my reading of that is people were very burned um, during the 2008 through nine sort of crisis and, you know, they resolved, you know, never again will I actually, you know, suffer this type of drawdown and how do I ensure that, you know, I have some sort of an insurance policy. We always have a tendency to fight the last battle. Um, so then it, you know, some of the liquid alts, some of the strategies certainly work well through episodes like early 2018 volatility spikes, um, COVID. So you go through it and then, you know, these look like they might be similar to 2008 through nine, but they're actually not. Like, you know, there's, and this is kind of what I mean by the sort of heterogeneity in terms of product and strategy implementation. Um, trend following itself sounds like a pretty simple strategy, but then there is a lot that goes into it. And then depending on how you implement it, it may or may not do well. And then most didn't do well um, during COVID, for example. So that's like, that's, that's number one thing to recognize in terms of, you know, what, what do we see in terms of the empirical evidence, so to speak, that's lived out of the, you know, sort of out of the sample, so to speak. The second piece is, I think, you know, we talk about this a lot. I think, you know, we have this illusion of 10 years is long enough somehow to, um, to give us some sort of evidence to reach to, you know, reach a conclusion. Um, maybe it is for certain things, but when it comes to investing, I kind of feel like the last 15 years has been just one big regime, which is the you know central banks um, having a very active role in molding and shepherding financial markets, uh, for better or for worse. I'm not commenting on that, but that's you know that's that's been a fact. And so when you have that presence, um, I think I think we just have to kind of like take this evidence in terms of you know, for what it is, given that context. Mm -hmm. And so those are my just, you know, opinions on around this issue. So I don't, I'm not necessarily down um, or um, bearish mm -hmm. on some of the liquid alt strategies per se, but then if it's an insurance policy, um, you know, we also shouldn't expect the insurance policy to continue to give us the premium. We're the, you know, so that's, you know, it's supposed to kick in when we have an issue. And like any good insurance policy, you should read the fine print. <laughs> so <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Interesting insights. Yeah. Well, we talked about complexity and the complex of strategies and tools. So a couple of things. One is that we have a new complex strategy that's been re introduced relatively recently, digital assets. So as you think about the research from your side, as you're um, talking to your colleagues, potential investors about the pros and cons of digital asset investing, and then on the tool side, which we'll talk a little bit more about, is artificial intelligence. So you have all of these PhDs and all of a sudden this big new tool has been introduced to you. Mm -hmm. So again, prioritizing your time. So I'm just curious, starting with digital assets, you know, does it have a place in an individual investor's portfolio from a research perspective as if you've done any of the work on it to date? So I think, I think we've done some thinking. I don't know if we, you know, I think it'll probably continue to go on. I think at this point, the general, and I'm just going to limit the discussion to um, digital currencies. Um, and, and when it comes to digital currencies, I think that's a little more, I don't know, it, fe it feels a little less... Um, a little more kind of a topic to understand just because we feel like we've seen something similar um, to that back in history um, and just in the you know monetary history of you know, you know the US and other countries 
um, where if you go back to the late 19th century and early 2000s, you know, the it was kind of like a like a thing. It was just basically constant. It was a constant uh, to be aware of, which is all these sort of local regional banks creating their own currencies. And then it'll go through the cycle of euphoria, boom, and then bust, and then they'll do it again. So, so I think kind of appreciating that history, and again, these things are never one for one, mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a bit of a parallel mm -hmm. um, and, you know, deep sort of seated in the digital currency movement and idea is that, oh, how do we know that, you know, these fiat currencies uh, will be there forever? Mm -hmm. What if, what if they don't, you know, what if the inflation, you know, goes out of hand and, and all the, all these sort of thoughts. And I think there are, there are reasonable thoughts. Um, but at this point, I think where we are is, um, it's probably not, I mean, you know, it's not an, it's not a, an income yielding asset, mm -hmm. any of these digital currencies. And, um, it's more of a hedge strategy to the extent that people felt uncomfortable mm -hmm. about, again, the fiat currency, uh, the dollar here. So I think that's where we are. Yeah, I would add, I think, you know, that going back to the comment earlier about, you know, people don't understand risk. I think they they especially have a hard time thinking about the risks involved in these kind of new, you know, investment opportunities or vehicles. And so um, one of the things that that definitely sort of raises hackles for me, at least, is this notion of, of crypto in a 401k where, you know, you're, you're trying to invest for the long run. There's, you know, this sense that, hey, this is going to be your nest egg for, for 20, 30, 40 years of retirement. Um, and people might, you know, see a, a TikTok video about, you know, hey, invest in Bitcoin and they get this wild idea. And I think the the challenge is not understanding the risk reward sort of breakdown and and putting your nest egg in something that we we don't necessarily know enough about, mm -hmm. right? Um, is is real. There's a risk uh, of temptation mm -hmm. that investors face uh, when they're so excited about this new product, you know, well it's not not quite new anymore, but this uh, modern uh, product and, and many may see it as a get rich quick type scheme. Um, you know, you're, a few years ago, the, the Reddit discussion forums were all about YOLO, right? YOLO, just, just, you know, make a risky move and maybe it'll pay off. It's like a lottery ticket. And if it doesn't work, who cares? You know, you're going to be just right back to square one. Yeah, I missed the uh, journal publication on YOLO. I, <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, at Vanguard, we really encourage, you know, don't, don't chase returns, don't chase the latest fads. Like, you know, it might be tempting and, and emotionally it's, it's, you know, leading you in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, you know, the evidence shows that when people make sort of sound decisions and kind of keep that long-term perspective uh, is when they do better. Well, uh, something we certainly don't know enough about is artificial intelligence. So have you explored the behavioral implications of artificial intelligence? It's a great question. Uh, I'll say on a personal note, a few years ago when I first heard the term robo-advisor, I got very excited because mm -hmm. I envisioned essentially a chat bot that could help you make better financial choices. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that it was just, you know, automated investment, you know, portfolio management. I, I got a little less excited. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that's really exciting about, you know, some of these automated solutions is that it potentially feeds, it fills our need uh, for, let's call it being cognitive misers, right? So this notion that we're very selective about how we deploy our mental energy. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, maybe even most investors, there's probably something else that they'd rather spend their time and energy on than managing their portfolio or making complex decisions. And so to the extent that they can get, you know, quick answers without having to do research themselves. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's, that's fascinating about ChatGPT, you can ask a very nuanced, complex question mm -hmm. and you'll get an answer right away. It may not be accurate. So <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. a caveat. We'll put a disclosure on the podcast. I, I think if you can yeah. fix the accuracy, uh, it could be quite compelling, and I think you could get to a point where there is something more like a what I thought was a true robo. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now, the 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 downside to that, and I think where the current state of these tools uh, falls short, is on the EQ side. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask, you know, I'll put it this way: ChatGPT is not a very good therapist. It does not have a good sense of humor. I asked ChatGPT a couple weeks ago to tell me a joke, and it and it gave a bad pun. Mm -hmm. And I said, "No, that's not a good joke. That's a bad pun. Tell me, tell me something that's not a pun." And it just gave me a series of bad puns. And I'm a dad, so I appreciate dad jokes, but it, it just it doesn't understand sort of the human emotional side of the equation. And so when we think about you know this notion of oh could ChatGPT or you know these types of tools 
replace advisors. Mm -hmm. And given the fact that one of the biggest parts of the value of advice is the emotional value, you know, behavioral coaching, kind of helping people stay calm during market volatility, uh, it may be a long time before it, it closes the gap mm -hmm. with a really good human advisor. Uh, but it's definitely something to keep our eyes on. How about from a risk management perspective? I think a very helpful framework I found to think about all these things, because I think it's a fact that it's only going to get better, um, um, is given by this person uh, by the name of Avi uh, Goldfarb. He's a professor up in University of Toronto. Um, and um, he has a series of books that the latest is called The Power and Predictions. And, and the way he thinks about, he kind of like lays this out, is that um, when we do investing or when we, do, when, we, when we make any decisions, really, we do two things. Um, one is prediction. And, 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 and it may not be like, oh, X is going to happen, but I think it's, it's an inherently sort of a probability statement. You know, is there going to be a recession or not? That's a probability statement. It's just a matter of, you know, whether it's a matter of whether it's 70% or 30%. Mm -hmm. But, you, you know, you come up with that prediction. And then what you do is basically there's a human or, you know, maybe non-human judgment that goes along with it where you actually then take an action mm -hmm. in terms of what you do with that prediction. Um, investment is an inherently prediction and judgment sort of a business. Mm -hmm. And um, even for something like something as simple as or what people might, uh, you know, mistakenly perceive as simple as managing an index fund, um, there is actually the notion of prediction and judgment. Like, is this particular stock going to come off, um, get de delisted or not? That's actually sort of a, that's not easy, mm -hmm. um, but that's a probability um, it's a contingency that portfolio managers have to deal with all the time. And that then figures into the trading volume. What does everybody else in the street know? All that sort of, a, you know, that, 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 that whole sort of a bag of worms you need to deal with. So I feel like with generative AI or just, you know, really any other artificial intelligence, you can probably um, get a lot of help in, help in terms of maybe making the predictions better. But I think judgment is still very much um, preserved. Um, it's actually still very much the domain of humans for now. And I think that's, it's just a matter of like, how do we actually make use of this new technology and maybe get up on the learning curve? Well, there's a lot of work to do. Excellent points. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you both. Um, so a question I've been asking many of our guests, uh, though I think this might be the last time because we're more than halfway through the year, is uh, a quote that I've been carrying uh, since March with uh, some of our conversations, which is there are years that ask questions and years that answer. So for both of you, what do you believe 2023 is going to present for the remainder of this year? Now, I know you're professional questioners, um, but as you think about the, the answers, where do you think that balance could be struck? I'd like to believe that 2023 is the year of investor resiliency. Um, so 2022, you know, we saw that despite the market continually declining, that investors largely stayed the course. 2023, they're still staying the course. Their expectations are improving. They've, they've been through the ringer over the past three years. And I hope that it means that they're, they're well prepared to handle whatever may come down the line. Uh, but I will say, you know, the, the data will, will tell us uh, and time will tell. For me, it's been a sort of a year that led me to a lot of history books. Um, and and I, 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 mean, I don't mean to maybe, you know, I don't mean to skirt the question, but I think there is the notion of it's been a it's been a um, if I have to decide between questions and answers, I think it's been a, a year of questions. And to a degree, I feel like we have more resolution in terms of, you know, whether it's going to be there's going to be a recession is going to be, you know, um, soft landing or not. But I think this goes back to some of the things that I said earlier, which is I feel like we've just lived in one return environment since 2008 or 19. Mm -hmm. And that's a you know, very um, sort of heavy presence of central banks. Mm -hmm. um, and part of you know, risk management um, and thinking about very long term is that you have to think about how this is all going to conclude. And um, so that's, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a question. Um, it's also fascinating to see the market um, kind of really, you know, take the cue from AI, the rise of AI and all these other sort of uh, sentiment boosting um, events to really then um, 
you know, to turn into not a bull market just yet, but you know, to recover as much as it has. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's fascinating. And then I think these things you just don't appreciate the nuances of, um, you know, after four or five years um, have passed. Mm -hmm. But then that's why, you know, what brings me back to the history of books, because that's where you find, um, you know, all these sort of little nuances. Can you share a book? So the, I guess the most recent book that I found interesting was, so I'm actually sort of into rereading some of the autobiographies I read. Mm -hmm. So so I reread um, Keeping at It, uh, Paul, Bo Paul Volcker, mm -hmm. um, you know, in light of the inflationary. And then mm -hmm. um, in the middle of rereading um, Bob Rubin's um, autobiography. Well, we're getting close to the top of the hour, and I would absolutely love another hour of your time, but I know we're all very busy. Um, so I would just be grateful, because we ask this of, of all of our guests, just the mentors, the people who have influenced your careers along the way. Um, maybe, Andy, starting with you, if you think about those folks who sure. helped, you, helped you get along. Yeah, I think it was probably my second year in grad school. I had the opportunity to, re, uh, to meet with um, a researcher who became my postdoctoral mentor, Sir Laura Carstensen. She's a professor at Stanford. And I was very young and I was naive and I was just super pumped to be a researcher. And I said something to the effect of, you know, I'd rather do research that's counterintuitive and clever than research that's conservative and incremental. And she kind of pauses and she thinks about it and she goes, hmm, well, it's important to have a good balance. <laughs> and what she was basically telling me is, you know, don't get too excited, kid, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and it's really stuck with me, mm -hmm. you know, because I think mm -hmm. over, over time I realized, you know, whether it's your, your research portfolio or your investment portfolio, like balance is key. And so our team tries to strive for, you know, we want to do some sort of moonshot groundbreaking research, like something nobody's ever found before, mm -hmm. something that's going to, you know, grab headlines, things like that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like you can't just swing for the fences every time. Like it's really important to do just kind of the basic work, like understanding answers to basic questions. And so finding the right balance and not kind of always chasing after headlines, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think is the key to success for, for researchers, for teams and for you know groups like ISG. So having that diversified research portfolio uh, has served us tremendously well. So I have two people, um, I promise to keep him brief. <laughs> Jonathan Parker, so he's my uh, thesis advisor from Northwestern. Now he's at MIT. Um, and and the, the two people, including Jonathan, that I'm going to mention um, are, is they're certainly mentors, and I still, you know, very much see them and then, you know, stay in touch with them. But also, maybe they mean as much to me because of just kind of how they lead their lives. Mm -hmm. So, so in that sense, more of a, you know, role model, um, the, who you can just basically, you know, watch from a distance and still learn a ton from. So the thing about Jonathan is that he still is one of the most, if not the most, dynamic person to be in the seminar, same seminar with. And, and the reason for that is somehow in this sort of a age of hyper specialization, and that's true in academia too, where it takes like several years to really, you know, become that sort of skilled artisan uh, on your field. Mm -hmm. He somehow managed to have this wide range so he can... He has this ability to go from behavioral economic theory to, you know, empirical behaviors of consumer, um, you know, consumer behaviors to just pure macroeconomics. And, and he has the chops to somehow just, you know, go from one field to another um, and be productive at the same time. And, and that I always thought, you know, as a grad, grad student, I always thought that was really how does the person do that? Mm -hmm. um, but then... You know, I guess, you know, enough time has passed and I just appreciate how um, how neat that is to be able to borrow all these ideas and then somehow, you know, make it your own. Um, so that's 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 one person. And then another person is actually, you know, he's still at Vanguard, um, John Amerix. Mm -hmm. So uh, John Amer John's interesting because I had come across his name as a grad student and I thought to myself, well, an interesting person who does a lot of academic research, who works at Vanguard. That's what I thought. And then when I first came in, I, it, you know, it was basically his group that I was a risk senior risk manager. Um, and, um, I, you know, there are many great things about John, but then what I, the, the one thing that I'll say is that somehow he, maybe similar to Jonathan, somehow finds a way to be very relevant academically mm -hmm. and keep that passion alive while also being a, um, you know, very effective um, investment management executive. Um, and he has a day job. And somehow he finds synergy between the two worlds. And I think, you know, someone else could have told me that, oh, you could actually do it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I'm sure I would have been, you know, receptive to the idea, but it's one thing to hear to hear that and then another thing to actually see someone actually do it. And um, yeah, so for, for both the reasons, they're uh, my role models. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Dan, next time I'm going to ask you, so I want you to start thinking ready. about it. <laughs> uh, but in the interest of time, we will think about it for next time. Kevin and Andy, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. Uh, Dan and I greatly enjoyed the conversation. I know our audience did as well. Uh, congratulations on all of your accomplishments. We look forward to seeing more from you both. I'm sure we will. Um, so thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. If you want to learn more about Kevin, Andy, and Vanguard, please visit their website at www.vanguard.com. I encourage you to explore their research uh, as well as all of the information that's available on their site. Uh, you can find this episode and past episodes on Spotify, Apple, Google, or your favorite podcast platform. We're also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, check out our website at dakota.com. Finally, if you like what you're seeing and hearing, please Please, please be sure to like, follow, and share. Uh, we welcome your feedback as well. Again, thank you for being here. And again, to our audience, thank you for investing your time with us. Don't say goodbye.